Zachary Foster has a PhD in Near Eastern Studies from Princeton University. He is a fellow at the Rutgers Center for Security, Race, and Rights. He runs a digital archive called Palestine Nexus and writes a newsletter called Palestine in Your Inbox. So welcome, Zach. Thanks so much for having me, Katie. Let's start with some background. So, you know, one of the things that uh, Sky actually was referring to this, but obviously Zionists like to portray anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism as synonymous. And one of the things that, uh, you know, we try to do on this show is decouple those things, Jewishness and uh, Zionism. So I want to know how you went from being a Jewish Zionist to a Jewish anti-Zionist. Yeah, thanks for that question. Love talking about Judaism and Zionism and how I transitioned from Zionist, anti-Zionist. So I grew up in Jewish Detroit, um, going to Jewish schools and Jewish summer camps and Jewish youth groups and went to Israel with my Jewish youth group. And right, all those institutions are also Zionist, right? So I could have said I went to a Zionist school and a Zionist summer camp and a Zionist youth group um, <clears throat> because Judaism and Zionism were very much uh, uh, two sides of the same coin, right? We would celebrate a Passover. Uh, we would celebrate Israel's Independence Day. Uh, we would uh, we would say the prayer for the state of Israel in synagogue. We would say the Shema in synagogue. Right? You didn't even notice a difference. It wasn't. It was just part of Judaism if you weren't paying attention. Um, but of course, Judaism is a three thousand year old religion. Uh, Zionism is a hundred and forty year old political ideology. Right, so we're talking about religion on the one hand and political ideology on the other. These are very different things. That's why you can obviously be a Jewish Zionist. You can be a Jewish anti-Zionist. You can be a non-Jewish Zionist. You can be a non-Jewish anti-Zionist. Right? There's no real correlation uh, uh, between Zionism and Judaism. And I think, uh, it, 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 look, as someone who grows up in the environment I grew up in is not going to become an anti-Zionist overnight. It was obviously a process, right? The... I, I think the beginning of that process for me was actually spending some time in Jerusalem, in Palestine, in Israel. Um, I wanted to improve my Hebrew. I wind up in a Hebrew language class with half Palestinians who uh, are learning Hebrew for different reasons than me. Um, and, and that was my first introduction to Palestinian culture and Arabic and Palestinian life and more generally. And I was just a curious person. I wanted to learn more. And again, the beginning for me was not political. I was just... It was just more of a cultural curiosity. But I think the next thing that happened for me was I got more interested in history. And if you get interested in is Israel history and start reading Israeli history as it's written by uh, historians, Palestinian and Israeli historians, you discover some very disturbing things. You discover that every single major Zionist leader, uh, starting with Theodore Herzl in the 1890s, uh, going on to Arthur Rupin in the 1930s, and going on to Yosef Weitz and Jeff Zabotinsky. And all, and obviously David Ben Gurion, and almost every major uh, uh, Zionist thinker is asking the question: Well, how are we going to establish a Jewish state in a land that is 70, 80, 90 percent non-Jewish? That's a problem. That they, they all struggle with that, and they land on different answers. Some of them are very naive and believe that, you know, the Zionists are gonna, um, you know, bring economic development and prosperity and uh, to, to the to the country, and thus the Palestinians will accept political subjugation. And there are some naive enough to believe that, but the majority view is that no, these people are, have deep roots in the country and they have a strong identity. And uh, no, they're they're not going to accept subjugation. They're going to resist. Um, and what do you do with a group of people who resists domination and subjugation? They all pretty much settle on uh, the same answer, which is transfer, uh, which is another way, which is how they described uh, 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 ethnic cleansing in the 1930s and 40s. Anyway, so that 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 way you start learning the history of. Oh my God, the Zionists are talking about transfer openly. Um, at some point after the 1920s, you have one Zionist in the 1920s, Israel Zangwill. He's very open about it and is publishing all these articles because he actually thinks the Arabs are going to be like voluntarily transferred and it's going to be good for them because they're going to get all this land in Transjordan and Syria, right? So he's talking about it openly in the 1920s. And then, the, and, and, and then the Palestinian Arabs quote him and be like, to, 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 to demonstrate the uh, Zionism's uh, uh, ultimate aims and how nefarious the whole project is. Um, so anyways, they realized we better keep quiet about the whole transfer discussions. So anyways, you, you, you start to read the history of Zionism uh, as it's written by historians. By the way, it, plenty of them right wing. This isn't political. This is just, right. You don't have to be a, a progressive 
to have written this history. As you just said, you start learning about, so, so you learn about the transfer concept, the transfer thinking. What are we gonna, how are we gonna solve this problem? And then you read the history of the 1948 war itself, right? Where in the first few months of the war, Zionist forces expel tens if not hundreds of thousands of Palestinians by force. They go from village to village uh, in, the centra, in the central parts of the country. Uh, Ramle, Lid, they go to the coast, Tantura. And then by the fall, they go to the north, the Galilee. And they expel Palestinians from the village by gunpoint. Hundreds of thousands of Palestinians. And then by the end of the war, they shoot at anyone trying to come back to their home, right? In the year after the war, they massacre more than 1,000 Palestinians. The guns fell silent. The, the armistice agreements have already been signed. The war is over. They're slaughtering Palestinians on a daily basis. Palestinians returning to their homes uh, uh, because they were expelled from them. And the war ended and they want to go back to their homes. So they're trying to go back and they're being slaughtered. And when you read that history, how can you not feel that this whole project was born in sin? And that this is a terrible, how is it that we're supposed to get liberation through another people's disenfranchisement and expulsion and displacement? So I think that's the starting point. And then, of course, the, it just gets worse, right? This is just the beginning. As you read what happened in the 50s, in the 1956 campaign, when Israel goes into Gaza on November 2nd and kills, grabs every male above the age of 15 in Khan Yunis, lines them up in the city center and executes them. You know, then they go to Rafah which every, all eyes are apparently on Rafah now. But then they go to Rafah a, month, a, few, a few weeks later. And then they massacre another 150 people in Rafah. You're like, this is supposedly, you know, little Israel against all these big bag Arab countries is going on neo-colonial wars, massacring Palestinians in Gaza in the 50s. And then, and then you learn about the occupation. And you go visit. And then you, you're curious. So you go to Masal Fariyata. You, you go to Homsa in the northern West Bank. You know, you go to you, you go to Nablus, you go to Janin, and you see on your, with your own two eyes the violence, the settler violence. You know, so I, I think it's it's not one thing, but it's it's reading the history and 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 learning Arabic so you can speak to Palestinians and learn what their life is like, and going in around and visiting people and all this fear mongering and oh my God, they want to kill us, right? That's the narrative you're raised with. What you discover is that it's all fiction. Was there a particular aha moment or a particular myth you saw through um, that you recall that shifted things for you? One thing I didn't mention was that I traveled to the Balkans uh, as a university student uh, in 2005, six, and I, I traveled with a group of half Jews, half Palestinians. And that was very impactful. Hearing stories, you know, here, here we are, Jews and Palestinians talking about Israel and Palestine. And we are, and, and we're hearing stories from Palestinians. Like, you know, my parents, my grandparents were expelled from Palestine by gunpoint. We want to go back to Palestine, but we can't because we're Palestinian. But you, American Jews, who don't speak a word of Hebrew, who have one Jewish grandparent, who have never been to the country, you can go and get a passport tomorrow. And you're like, wow, that's kind of fucked up. Sorry, excuse my language. But it, it, it's, so that was very impactful. Um, and then I think just spending more time, you know, it, it, it's gradual. It, it, it doesn't happen overnight. It's, it, you know, it's like, okay, at some point, I also, I'm not so worried what my parents think. I'm an intellectually mature person. I can formulate my own thoughts. I don't need my handheld anymore. In fact, I have a PhD in history. So maybe you should be listening to me rather than the other way around. Have you been able to convert anyone in your family? <laughs> I mean, I would say the short answer is no, but I would say the longer answer is that, yes, I, th I do think it's very hard when you have someone in your own family, you know, talking about what's happening all the time, not to, not for that not to have an impact on you. I think it has. I think it would be, I think people would be, you know, maybe a little bit uh, quiet, to, shy to admit that. But yeah, I, I think definitely it does have an impact. 